so I gotta have it hooked up to a cord.
I can appreciate the blessings of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, He has done great things. Yes. Because He is great. Yes. You can't expect anything less from God but greatness. Yes. God is great. And great is His name. Hallelujah. Yes. He deserves our praise and our glory. We give Him the praise. We give Him the glory this morning. God, we lift you up on high this morning. We magnify your name, God. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us, for keeping your head upon your people. That we're able to go and lean upon the everlasting arm of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are the answer for the world today. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Amen. Above him, there's no other. That's right. Jesus is the way. Hallelujah. Jesus is the truth. That's right. Jesus is the life. That's right. You know, there are a lot of lifestyles you can live out there, but there's only one life giver. There's only right. one that gives true life, true joy, true peace, true happiness. Those <laughs> lifestyles and the things that the world offer you do, do not satisfy. Right. At the end, they bring, they, bring, they bring misery. You may have a life full of pleasures and full of things that you worked hard for, but at the end of it, what is it when you show up, show, when you stand before God, and you have nothing that you did for his kingdom. Mm. It's all vain. Only the only thing that matter is what you have done for Christ right. in this That's lifetime. Right. Yes, we want to take care of our family. We want to provide for our, our um, spouse, husband, wife, daughter, you know, um, sisters, brothers. We want to look out for one another. Yes, mm. we want to look out for our neighbor. And all that stuff is good. But at the end, the only thing that matters is what we've done for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. The only thing that matters is what we've done for him. God loves us. God protects us. He keeps his hand upon us. Yes. His greatness, his, excuse me, his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God hasn't forsaken his people. I know we look around at the world and it seems like, you know, things are just going wrong on every hand. Every time you turn around, you know, there's always, and it's always been like, even when I was a kid, you know, you know, murders and stuff, people getting robbed and just, things just, just seem like they just should go the way they should go. But God is still reaching out to his people. God hasn't forsaken his people. God hasn't forgotten his people because he is love. Yes, right. amen. amen. Me and Pastor Watson was out in the community yesterday knocking on doors. We said, y'all was out knocking on it. And that he is. <laughs> yes. That's only a small thing compared to what Christ has done for us. That's right. We go out for a couple hours and, you know, to work on the new church building and go knock on the doors and, you know, um, 90 some degree weather. Heat index 100 and whatever. Like I told somebody, I said, man, if the heat index said 104, there's 104. So I'm talking about it, 91 degrees with the heat index feels like. Feels like what? Feels like 104. Well, that's the temperature. That's, that's right. what I mean. Yes. <laughs> so a heat index uh, feels like, okay, well, you feeling that? I guess we're feeling it too. I guess it feels like it for you, but not for us. It's 91 for us. So yeah, no, we feel it. But you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a small thing just to give back. You know, we could work 24 hours out of a day, and that still would be nothing compared to what Christ did for us. Amen. But dying on the cross for our sins, he didn't have to do it, but he did. If you ever want to be a part of it, if you ever want to join us for whatever we have going on, reach out to the community, you know, let us know. And we'll, you know, be happy to come pick you up and come knock on doors with, with us. Um, you know, just to get together and tell people about the goodness of God, let people know about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, remember our Bible studies this week. Um, Tuesday men's Bible study. Pastor, um, give with Pastor Watson and myself. We'll let you know where we, where we, where we will be meeting. 6.30 um, is the time. Different locations in the area. Also, our Wednesday night Bible study stream all the way at 6.30. And um, the latest Bible study, um, 6.30, if it was Sister Watson or my wife, and then we'll let you know the locations um, where they will be meeting at. It's truly been a blessing. God has been really doing the work in people's lives and the, the teaching, what God has been showing us and just um, teaching in this series of Bible studies has really been a blessing. I always have good reports out of um, the ladies' Bible study, and I'm in the men's Bible studies, and, and it's truly a blessing. Amen. Um, at this time, we're going to ask Brother Brad to help us receive the Sunday morning tithe and offerings. Let's be a part and give a good offering as unto the Lord. Brother Brad, we ask God to bless the offering this morning. Lord, we thank you today for opportunity to give you our gifts and give you, Lord, that we may pay our 10% of you, Lord. And we thank you. And please honor us and bless us today as we this home. Amen. 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 Amen.
out for this morning. Let's get our mind on God. Let's turn our hearts to a heart of worship. Let's set our mind on Jesus Christ this morning. We're going to sing that song, How Great Is Our God. Amen. How Great Is Our God. Thank you for being so great. He's not an average God. He's not a lonely God. He's a real God because He is the only God. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. God, you're so great. And this morning, God, we want to sing this song as for you, God. We want to sing this song and lift you up this morning. Sing it to you, God. Make a merit melody in our heart. Lift your name high, just praising you. God, we know you're here this morning, and we know you're in the midst of your people because you want to bless. You want to move. Don't close your heart this morning. Open your heart. God has a blessing for you. Yeah, hallelujah. If you would allow him to bless. Why? Because all power is in his hand. That's right. And he is great. Hallelujah. Give God a hand out of the way. Let's say that to this morning to our Lord and Savior. How great is our God? Come on. Oh, 
lifestyles out there that you can live but only one way truth and life and it brought to my mind my heart uh, the books that Peter wrote first and second Peter and and first Peter one of the main themes of first Peter is living in righteousness in a sin-filled world it's one of the main themes of, of first Peter when you read through it, it it talks about hey look you know we're living for righteousness they're living in sin. They think it's strange that we're not running with them to the same excess of right. They think it's strange that we're not going after the same things that they are. But we're living for God. Right. Second Peter, one of the main themes is that God is certainly going to judge the unrighteousness in this world. Uh, but that he will bless those who follow after him. In Second Peter... When he speaks of the, the passing away of, of the current world as God establishes uh, the world to come, he asks the question, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? He asks the question because we know these things, because God expects us to live righteously in a sin-filled world, and because we know that God will judge the ungodliness of this world, how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to live? And he answers the question in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord. That's how we're supposed to live. All right. We're supposed to live in all holy conversation. Conversation just doesn't mean two people talking it out. Conversation means our entire way of life. Yes, yes, yes. And he says it's supposed to be holy and godly as we anticipate his coming. Yes, sir. And he goes on to say some people think that the Lord's just not going to come back. <laughs> and it's going to continue on the way that it's always been since our grandfathers and their grandfathers were talking about it. And he goes on to say from that that it's only his delay that's extending mercy towards those who will come to him before he returns. Nevertheless, that's what I uh, recalled to mind and, and the Lord laid on my heart as he was talking about there's lots of lifestyles that people can live, but there's only one way, truth and life. Oh, yes, yes. 
to come unto the Father, and it's through Jesus Christ. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, we could ask the question, how should we then live? How should we then live? Because we know all of these things. We need to live in all holy conversation and godliness. Praise the Lord. Taking our message this morning, a scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, beginning at verse 25, where it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Not talking about babies. Talking about those who have just come to knowledge. Okay? Not those who have studied for a long time and in their studying think they know it all, but those who realize, I've still got so much to learn. And that's key here. So much to learn. <laughs> I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Then addressing the people who heard him, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father, neither knoweth any man but the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light taking for our text for the message this morning, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For the title of the message this morning, we'll be preaching, Learning of Jesus. Reverend Brooks, please pray over the message and the messenger this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this message this morning, Father. God, I ask you to bless Pastor Watson as he preaches what you've laid upon his heart to share, to share with us, us this morning. God, give him a fresh unction of the Holy Ghost, God. Make preaching easy for him this morning, Father. Open our hearts to receive what you've prepared, God. We thank you for everyone here, God, and attendance, God. And we pray that we continue to do your will and to do what you've laid upon our heart, God. Continue to work, move, and accomplish your will in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In this passage, Jesus first thanked the Father that those who came to him with simple faith were those who received the knowledge of who he was and the blessing of salvation from the Father. And we can read throughout the Gospels other accounts where he told the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, look, you come to me and you think you know everything. You come to me, but they that are whole need not to be made whole. Those that are sick need a physician, but those that are whole do not need a physician. But because you think you are whole, then you're not going to gain anything from me. You're not coming to me looking for anything. You're coming to me thinking that, you know, you don't need anything. So you're not going to gain anything from me. But there's these multitudes out here who see their need and who know where they can gain from in order to meet that need. And so their need is met. And in this passage again, Jesus thanked the Father. Lord, it's not the wise, it's not the prudent, it's not the full of himself. It's not the proud, it's not the boastful, it's not the ones who lord over others their knowledge. But it's the humble, it's the meek, it's those who come acknowledging their need, whose need you meet. And then he said the same of himself. I am meek and lowly in heart. I'm not going to put you down for coming to me. Mm -hmm. right. Jesus said, I'm not going to put you down when you reach up to me. Right. There are so many who will take that hand that's reaching up and then lift them up. And then because they've done something for them, they're going to say, now you're on the hook to do something for me. Mm -hmm. They're going to manipulate that person. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't manipulate us. Right. He says, now obey me. Right. But he expects us to obey him out of love. That's right. If we That's choose right. not to, he says, okay, don't. 
You're not going to receive the blessings that I offer. You're not going to receive the continued benefits of a child of God. But look what I've done for you. I still did for you. You still have that testimony. Mm -hmm. And that testimony, that knowledge is still within you. Yes. You know where it came yes. from. You know what the source of that blessing was. And you know that if you want to continue receiving blessings and have eternal life, you've got to return to me. Here I am. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And if they call out saying, Lord, I don't know where to find you again. He says that he'll leave the 90 and 9 and go find that one lost sheep who's crying out, saying, I don't know if I can come back to God. God says, I'll come to you. All right, all right. God is not going to put a person down for calling on him. And he addressed his listeners after he addressed the Father and offered them the opportunity to learn this truth, to learn that everything that he has to offer is available to those who say, I need it. I want it. I don't have it yet. It cannot be supplied to me by my own efforts. It cannot be supplied to me by my own uh, 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 putting in the time, putting in the strength, putting in the man hours. It cannot be supplied to me by the world. It cannot be supplied to me by these gurus. It cannot be supplied to me by this businessman. It cannot be supplied to me by any other source. But God says I can have it if I'll just come unto him. Amen. Amen. And all these other ones who said they can offer me something, they expect something in, uh, in return from me by way of manipulation. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. We join ourselves up to him and learn of him. We say, this is the way I want you to go. And we're joined up to Jesus walking in his ways, that yoke. Just as you would imagine if you've ever seen a picture of a of a oxen, a pair of oxen pulling a plow, or of, of mules pulling a covered wagon, or whatever kind of picture you might uh, imagine in your mind, uh, these animals of burden pulling a load. And they've got that yoke, that, that wooden beam carried across their shoulders so that they share the load together. Right. Well, when we're joined up to Jesus and that bar across our shoulders. He's the one carrying the weight of the load. So right. we're just That's going right. along with That's him. Right. And guess what happens? If we feel the weight of that load, there's two reasons. It's because we start pulling in another direction. And that's, the not, that's not the direction that we're supposed to go. All right. But we say, wait a second, it's getting heavy. It's starting to hurt when I go that way. It's starting to hurt when I go this way. And Jesus says, it's because I'm going this way. I'm leading this way and you're leading that way. It's going to hurt. The weight of the transgressor is hard, the Bible says. Or it's because he starts to kind of just give us a little bit of weight. Say, I'm still here. All right. I'm still here. That's I'm true. carrying the heavier That's part. Right. But true. I want you to know that you're still joined up with me. All right. You say, Jesus, thank you for being with me through this box. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for being with me through this trial. I know I'm making it because you're still with me. All right. I wouldn't oh, be yes. able to carry this on my own. But he said, right. take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Okay? And that's the message that we're preaching this morning. Learning of Jesus. Learning of Jesus. His disciples had to learn this lesson. His own disciples, the 12 that he called when he called Peter and Andrew and James and John from their boats, when he called Matthew from the custom table, when he called all the rest of the disciples, he said, come and follow me. And they had to learn this lesson to follow Jesus and to learn of him. When he said unto them, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. He began to teach them that they ought to have learned the multitudes. He began to teach them. This was after he had fed the multitudes, the 5,000, John chapter 6. The disciples were there and they said, Jesus, this whole multitude has come to hear you preach, hear you teach, and now they're hungry. Send them away. And he said, no, they came to me. I'm not going to send them away. He said, you give them something to eat. And they said, we don't have anything to give them to eat. The only food here is this boy with his little uh, fishes and loaves. But what is this among so many? And Jesus said, okay, we'll feed them with what we got. Just make them sit down in an orderly fashion. And we'll use what we've got to feed them. And with two fishes and five loaves, he fed 5,000. Yes, right. And it says 5,000 men besides the women and children yes, that were with them. He doesn't number them. 
How many more were there? And he fed them. And then that night, Jesus got in the boat and went across the sea. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then that morning, the multitude started looking for Jesus because they were hungry again. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, he said to them, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Because what do we all expect for life to sustain us? See, I need to eat again. Mm -hmm. When we're hungry, we need to eat. And Jesus said, no, I will sustain you. All right. What if you don't get what you think you need? What if you don't get the things that you think are have to be on time? You still have faith in them. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. In John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well of Samaria, and the disciples went into town to get bread, and they came back, Jesus told them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. That's right. Okay. He began to teach the disciples. Not just the twelve, but the multitudes. What they ought to have learned. That Jesus is life. That's right. There's yeah. life beyond yeah. this temporary plane. Yes. Okay? But many who were not joined unto him, they heard his words, but they weren't joined unto him. They weren't yoked unto him. They went away. They were hoping to get just what they wanted from him. Just the needs that they saw, not the needs that God saw for them. Okay, they went away from him. But when Jesus turned to the twelve who were beginning to learn these lessons, it says in John chapter 6, still in the same passage, from that time many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. That's the multitude, it's not the twelve that were with him. Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter began to realize there's more to life than just the 70, 80 years that you might live on this world. There's eternal life in Jesus. Oh, yes. And so he said, I yes. need more than just the bread that you gave me yesterday. I need your words of eternal life. Amen. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. They knew because they were with him. They saw the proof of who he was, and they believed on him. They were yoked together with him. They were learning these lessons. They oh, learned right. that serving him meant more than just asking for what they wanted. That's right. Okay? Meant more than just asking for what they wanted. Now, I ask God for the things that I want. We all should. He told us to. Okay? But what do I do in the meantime? Because... A lot of times I wait. I say, God, I, I want this. I, I need that. God knows my needs before I ask him. Yes, the tells yes, me that. Yes, Jesus right. said so. And while I bring him my needs in prayer, because he told me to do that, mm -hmm. I wait. And while I'm waiting, I'm still faithfully serving him. Come on. The oh, disciples yes. were yes. learning that lesson. They learned that serving him more than meant more than just asking Come for on. what they wanted. Say now it. listen say to it. this. Say Even it. if what they say wanted it. was unselfish. Mm -hmm. Even if what they wanted was for someone else. Right. Even if what they wanted was a good thing. Even if what they wanted was something that would honor God. And I ask God to give things that would be good for other people. And I'm sure you do too. God bless me with this. I want to use it to help somebody else. God bless somebody else with this. And even still, while we're praying, we're faithfully serving. And the disciples had to learn that lesson, that even if the things that I want are not for myself, it's completely unselfish, it's for somebody else, it's going to honor God. Even while we're waiting, we're going to faithfully serve him. That's right. Okay? Asking for something of God and being assured of the response comes from faith. Okay? Faith. And another word for faithfulness is dedication. We must be dedicated to God, go. even while we're waiting for the response right. from him, right. even if that response takes a long time. That's why he preached uh, that parable of the unjust judge who responded to that widow woman who came to him saying, avenge me of my adversary, and he just got tired of putting up with her, and so he said, I'll avenge her response just so she'll leave me alone. And then he said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes to respond, is he going to find those who were faithful to him right. in asking, in seeking him, and living for him in the time that it took him to respond? Right. Okay? But the disciples, that was a parable that he taught, but the disciples had to learn it in real life. And it's recorded for us here. 
It's recorded for us. We all know about the story of, uh, or not the story, it really happened. We all, we all know about uh, what happened when Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto the top of the mountain and was transfigured before them. And about how Peter didn't know what to say, and Peter being Peter just started talking, and he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's let's just stay up here. Let's build a tabernacle, one for you, one for Moses, and one for, for uh, Elijah. And then God spoke out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then the cloud lifted and, and Jesus stood there before them. And Jesus said, come on, we gotta get down the mountain. There's, there's more work to do. And we have all been in, in church services where it was just so glorious. We said, I don't ever want this to end. Kind of like Peter was experiencing. But he didn't know what to say. It was just so glorious to be there with, with Jesus glorified and, and seeing Elijah and Moses and saying, I, I don't ever wanna leave. Let's just build tabernacles and stay up here. But then Jesus said, there's still more work to do. Even in those glorious church services, we still got to go out with yes, the doors sir. again. That's right. God. Yes, sir. That's what Jesus was saying. Why? Because when they came down the mountain, we read Matthew chapter 17, when they would come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. Oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the waters. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. And then came the disciples apart to Jesus and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. He said this to his disciples. He said this to the disciples that the man brought the demon-possessed child to, and they were surely saying, in the name of Jesus, come out of that man. But they didn't have the belief of what they were saying. They didn't have the belief of what they were saying. Right. Even right. though they were saying, in Jesus' name, uh -huh. or whatever they were saying, they didn't have the belief of what they were saying. Jesus said unto them, believe, uh, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith in the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove ye hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth out not but by prayer and fasting. So even though it takes faith to do anything for God, there are some things for God that he's going to expect. More dedication. There you go. There are some things from God that he's going to expect. Right. More proof of faithfulness. Yes. Now what, yes. what kind of things, Pastor? I'm not the one that decides that. Come on. Sure. I'm not the one. There might be something that you prayed for for God if he gave it to you right like that. Mm -hmm. And he right. said, I want to bless you, my child. Yes, and there might be some things even right now that you've been praying for God for months, for years for. And he's just saying, we need to prove a little bit longer. All right. yes, and not to, that's not to do you wrong. That's not to discourage you. That's so you can see, I prayed for God for this. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, uh, Hannah, when she prayed for her son. <laughs> and she went to the ta uh, ta uh, tabernacle and she named her son Samuel and she said, for this child I prayed. How long had she been tormented by uh, Elkanah's other wife? And how long had she just been in anguish over soul and been praying for a child? And she got her son and she said, for this son I prayed. Sometimes there's just something so glorious that God says it's going to be all the more glorious just for you waiting. It's going to be all the more glorious for you waiting. You're not missing anything out right now, brother, sister. You're not missing anything out right now, my child. It's going to be all the more glorious for you waiting. There are some things that he'll give you right as soon as you ask for it. And you'll say, my goodness, I wasn't expecting it so quickly. But there are some things that he's going to prove you for. And again, it's not to discourage you. It's to prove you. Yes. Yes. To prove it to you, Man. this is God doing it. All right. If I could have done it, I would have done it long ago. This is God doing it. <clears throat> Praise God. They had to learn that lesson. Amen. Then the twelve learned that lesson. The twelve learned that lesson about following Jesus, about proving faithfulness in their own lives. They learned what it meant to serve and live in obedience. They, let, they learned that serving God meant even being obedient while they were waiting for what they wanted. 
They learned that in dedication to God, uh, they would be used by God to do greater things. Okay? And there were more among the multitudes that followed Jesus who also learned these lessons. In Luke chapter 10, it says, After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also. So there were the twelve, and among uh, the twelve, there were seventy others. And he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. So he said, I'm going to go and preach into these places and into these cities. I want you to go in there first and get these people ready to hear me preach. Right. Okay. Coming down a little further, it says the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So they learned that lesson from that boy that they couldn't cast the devil out of. They learned, okay, it takes dedication. It takes serving God. Some things take more dedication. And so they dedicated themselves more. And God answered that dedication. Okay? But what did they still have to learn? Listen to this. He said unto them, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and, scor serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Neither, uh, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He told them, look, there's more to living for me than just seeing the devil flee from you. Come on, come on. Because the results of our faithfulness are not just shown in this life. Seeing the things that we get in this life. Seeing the things that we pray for come to pass. It's glorious, especially when we see somebody delivered from the power of the devil. Knowing that God's going to do a further work in their life as they serve him. Right. But it's not just the immediate results that we see that are glorious. There's something more glorious. The results of faithfulness to God are shown in eternity. All right, that's right. The results of faithfulness to God are shown in eternity. Yes. Yes. My goodness, I heard of... A man, uh, a quote from a man, and I forget who it was. It was one of those old time preachers. And he said, when I get to heaven, there's going to be three wonders that I see. One, that there will be people there who I wasn't expecting to see. Come on. There will be people there that I wasn't expecting right. to see. Yes, sir. My goodness, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> but that will be glorious. Amen. 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 Two. That there will be people that I was expecting to see who wasn't there. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. But the Bible tells us that God will wipe away every tear and there won't be any sorrow. Okay? Three, that I made it at all. Hmm. Come on. I think about that first one, that there will be people there that I wasn't expecting to see. And I'll say, You made it? Praise God. Amen. Yeah. But then I think about the opposite side of that. Then I'll be there and other people weren't expecting to see me. <laughs> right. That's the truth. Because there are some people who knew me growing up, who knew me for years before I got saved. Right. And I'll get there and they'll see me and they'll recognize my face out of the crowd and they'll say, Matthew, is that you? Is that really you? Right. My goodness, it's going to be glorious. All right. yes, sir. The results of faithfulness are going to be shown in eternity. Mm -hmm. Reach out to somebody. Let them surprise somebody else up there. Amen. Just as we're going to be surprised by who we see. And we're going to surprise somebody else. All right, all right. But when we ask for God for things in this earth, even if it's a deliverance for somebody else from whatever binds them now, the more glorious thing is to make it into his presence. Amen. Yes. Amen. They had to learn this. Then Jesus told them, listen to this. this is, these are the things, what we've preached about so far, the things that they learned of him. The things that they learned of him. As he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. These are the things that the disciples learned of him while he was walking the streets of Israel. Okay? But then Jesus told them that after he returned to heaven, he would send them another comforter. There you go. Okay? Who would continue to teach them the necessary things to live for him after he was no longer standing right there beside them, okay, physically. I've been reading a book this week, and it's just been a wonderful book about, the book is called Acts Today, okay?
Okay? And it's about documented miracles. I mean, absolute miracles. Miracles of healing, miracles of resurrection, miracles of interpretation of tongues, miracles of, of angelic appearances, just absolute miracles that have happened, documented. Mm -hmm. Documented, that means he gives the names, he gives the places, he gives the hospitals. And the first one in the book was actually one that happened in Shreveport in 1993. Mm -hmm. When I started reading that book, I said, I wonder if there's anything in here that I can relate to. And then I read the first one, and it was Shreveport in 1993. Gave the lady's name, gave the hospital, gave everything. And, uh, but the book, uh, as, I, as I read through it, it would talk about the Holy Ghost as the comforter. And every time it mentioned the comforter, it would give the, the Greek, not every time, but, but often when it mentioned the comforter, the Greek word for comforter is paraclete, paraclete. Sometimes it's depending on the context and the, the uh, conjunction of the use, it would say parakletos. But, but the word means an advocate, the word literally describes somebody coming up alongside you to help you. All right. Like, I need help. And then he comes up to help you. Okay? Um, but the Bible says that the, the comforter, Jesus speaks of the comforter, the Holy Spirit, coming up alongside us to help us. He would continue to teach us the things that are necessary for us to live for him when he's not on the earth. Okay? Jesus said in John chapter 14, If any man love me and will keep my words, okay, again, the things that he taught, if any man will love me and will keep my words, my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me and keepeth not my sayings, and the words which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which hath sent me. But uh, these things have I spoken unto you, uh, yet being present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. All right. And bring all things to your remembrance, yes, yes. whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay? We're preaching about learning of Jesus. All right. The Holy Spirit teaches us, Jesus said, teaches us the things that he taught. The Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus taught. That's right. That's okay? Right. Jesus is the living word of God. Read John chapter yeah. 1. So being taught by the Spirit, being guided by the Spirit, means living according to the Bible. He doesn't reveal something new. That's right. Something new, something that's not contained in Scripture. He might reveal to us an application. This is how you ought to live according to the Bible. All right. But he doesn't give new things because it's contained in the Bible already. Mm -hmm. From Genesis to Revelation, that is the Word of God. He confirms truth. He applies truth. That's already revealed in the Word of God. If we are felt to be moved to, to do something, and that something cannot be confirmed or established in the Word of God, then it's not a feeling that's given by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not guide us into sin. That's right. The Holy Spirit that's does right. not guide us into confusion. Amen. Okay? The Holy Spirit guides us in righteousness, in holiness. Amen. And Amen. is the word of God. Some might say that a certain doctrine that's, you know, according to their teaching, but not found in the Bible, they'd say, oh, it has to be revealed to you. But God has revealed everything to us that's needed for salvation and righteousness. He's revealed all of it to us in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, all things are delivered unto me of the Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father knoweth any man. Uh, the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. That's what we just read in Matthew chapter 11. And then in John chapter 16, he said, how be it when he, the Spirit, is truth to come, he will guide you in all truth. Mm -hmm. And he shall not speak of himself. That means he's not going to make up new things that he says, this is what I'm telling you that hasn't been told to anybody else. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and will show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit might say, don't do that because something bad will happen, or do this and God will bless you. But it's all going to conform to the truth and righteousness and holiness of God's word. The Holy Spirit doesn't guide us in things that conflict with God's word. Okay? But Jesus told us that he's going to give us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the one who will come alongside us to teach us, to help us, to comfort us, to strengthen us. 
Right. And the Holy Spirit will continue to teach us, yes. to help us understand, to help us live according to right. God's word. Right. That's, That's why right. when he ascended, Jesus also said, it says he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. That promise is the one that he gave them in John chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, and continuing. He told them, wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith, you have heard of me. And then continuing down in Acts chapter 1, he said, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon right, you. Angel, and you shall be witnesses angel. unto me. Yes. Witnesses unto me. That's right. Not witnesses unto other things that, right. that have been told to you that, that don't conform to the Bible. That's right. You shall be witnesses of what the Bible says. Amen. 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 Not what you think. All right. Not what you've decided. But you shall be witnesses of what the Bible says. Okay? When he gave them the Great Commission, as he phrased it in Matthew, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them what? The things that you've decided, the things that you think, the things that you made up, the things that you interpret? No. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded right. you. We teach the Bible. We learn of Jesus. We're guided by the Holy Spirit in these words of Jesus. We apply them to our lives as the Holy Spirit gives us. Amen. We apply them in the way that we raise our families. We apply them in the way that we work industriously. We apply them in the way that we get along with other people according to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because Brother Brooks' life isn't the same as mine. That's right. So the Holy Spirit is uh, working in each of us individually. Amen. Okay? But we both have the same Bible. It's a no private interpretation. That's right. We're taught by the Spirit's conviction. By the Spirit's conviction. That means the Holy Spirit tells us when we're doing something wrong. We're taught by the Holy Spirit's conviction. And confirmation to the truth. That means the Holy Spirit tells us when we're true. When we're right. He says, hey, that's the way that I ought to be living. Just as we read uh, that passage from Peter just a moment ago. We're taught by the Bible, by the Holy Scriptures, because Jesus said, learn of me, and he is the word of God. Amen. Okay? And as Peter wrote again in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, know of this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Amen. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. They didn't make it up. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. That means even from the past, people were writing as God gave them the words to write about the things that Jesus would fulfill. His righteousness, salvation, holiness. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, I now write unto you. He said, they wrote unto you in times past. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God who in times past and in sundry ways spoke unto us by the prophets is now spoken unto us by his son. Okay? The Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the word of God fulfilled in the flesh. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, I now write unto you. In chapter 1, he said the, the, the Old Testament was written by these men who were written, uh, inspired by God. In chapter 3, he said, I now write unto you. Me, Peter, I now write you. But guess what? Guess what? That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets, by the commandment of us, the holy, uh, by us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. He said, we're still writing the word of God. But not just anybody out there, the apostles of us. Uh, of the Lord me and John and Matthew we're writing James and Jude we're writing what God has told us to write and then he comes down further you say well Paul didn't write uh, Paul didn't walk with Jesus while he was walking the streets of Jerusalem but then Peter comes down further and he said Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him that's written unto you All right. the book of Second Peter tells us what the Bible is. Amen. It's the words of the prophets of God and of the apostles of the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nobody else out there. Come on. That's Nobody right. else out there. That's right. Say, what about Mark and Luke? You know, Paul himself quoted from Luke. Mm -hmm. And Mark knew the apostles. Yes, sir. All of them. All of them. That's right. It was Mark's house that they all met in for their prayer meeting. And although it's not recorded in the Bible, church history tells us that he, when he wrote the, uh, the, the gospel of Mark, he actually wrote it from what Peter taught him. Okay. But we're taught of Jesus when we read the Bible. Right. Okay. All right. 
We're taught of Jesus when we when we walk with Jesus, right. when we're yoked up together with him. Yes. We're taught of Jesus when we're guided by the Spirit. And listen to this. I went through all of that preaching, and it's true. The Holy Spirit laid it on my heart to preach it. But what did it start with? It started when I was reading the Bible this week. I was, I've been reading through Psalms. Uh, I love reading the Psalms. Um, and I, I think it's a good habit. I'm not, I'm not telling you to do it, but I think it's a good habit for every Christian to, to read the Psalms through uh, periodically or, or a psalm a day or a couple of psalms a day. It's, it's a wonderful book of the Bible. Yes. Um, but we're, we're also taught by the example of godly people in our lives. You say, well, that's, you're talking about following people. No, I'm talking about following Jesus still. Amen. Listen to this. Because there's a, a generational truth in following God. A generational truth. That means the older and the younger. Okay? Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay? Because a lot of times you get you get older people who just get jaded, cynical about the younger generation. And, and they say, boy, this, this younger generation, they, you know. But Paul's words to Timothy were proof to them. Show them. Live your life as an right. example. There you go. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Right. Show right. them that the work, that the purpose of God is not lost on this new generation. Come on. That's right. Show them. That's right. Show them that God is still working yes. on those that seek Him, even though yes. they're much younger. Yes. Timothy, you'll be that example. You be that example. And then he also spoke to Titus about the older members of the church. He said, Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, charity, and patience. That the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Paul told Titus, look, the older members in the church have a responsibility to demonstrate that God is faithful through the years. All right, all right. There's, there's a generational proof that God is faithful in the younger and the older. In the younger and the older. Those values hold true through life. Amen. Amen. They'll keep you. That's God right. will bless you through them. That's right. Even as Peter wrote, the old-fashioned ways are good. Even as we read through uh, uh, the Old Testament books where, where uh, God speaks about not moving the landmarks mm -hmm. and seek ye the old paths wherein is righteousness. Okay, what are, you, what are you talking about, Peter speaking the old-fashioned ways? Peter wrote, to, Peter wrote his books 2,000 years ago, right? And when he was talking about modesty, he said, he said look, people right now are saying, this was 2,000 years ago, he was saying, look, people right now are saying that Christians are old-fashioned and that they're, they're living according to old ways. He said, well, tell the women to, to be like Sarah. Well, Sarah was 2,000 years before Peter. <laughs> so that was old-fashioned. That was a lot old-fashioned. That was 2,000 years before Peter. Okay, and it still holds true. They're always going to call Christians old-fashioned. That's right. Yes, sir. And we should hold that as a mark of faithfulness. That's right. As a mark of endurance. As a mark of the steadfastness of God's grace. Okay? That's right. Okay? But the, the, the point that I'm getting at here is that there is a generational truth that we see among the older and younger members of the church that we must appreciate the older shouldn't despise the younger mm -hmm. and the younger must respect the older mm -hmm. okay and where did you get all this from pastor you said you were reading through the psalms i got this through psalm 78 give ear O my people to my law incline your ears to the words of my mouth i will open my mouth in a parable i will utter a dark saying of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from our children. Come on, come on. Show into the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength 
and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he hath established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts aright, but whose spirit was not steadfast with God. That's Psalm 78, 1 through 8. It's a very long psalm, but just that opening passage of it tells us where he says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which were heard and known. He says, there's, there's been people that have left this off, but this isn't something that God ever forgot about. This is something that we're supposed to hold on to. If there arises a rebellious generation and we see a turning away in our society and destruction, then we need to keep looking back. Okay, right. and learn from the righteous generation right. that God was blessing and yes, turn sir. to their ways That's and right. find out how God prospered them. And we need to follow after their example. And the younger need to look to the older and the older need to teach the younger and not despise them and not say there's no hope for them. But there needs to be a joining together. And I was thinking about this. And I was driving through Shreveport, Bossier City, and I'd see signs on churches, and I'd hear ads on the radio. And it wasn't just one denomination, it wasn't just one church. I saw at least three or four where they would advertise their service schedule. And they'd say, we have a traditional service, and we have a contemporary service. And what do you think of when you think of a traditional service and a contemporary service? You think of the traditional being the old-fashioned music, maybe a preacher with white hair, so, and then you think of the contemporary service as, as new uh, sir, uh, new music. Maybe it's it's kind of got a rock and rolly beat, and and a, a preacher who doesn't wear a tie, and, and it's more geared towards younger people, maybe college age people. And I think about that, and I I, I haven't been to all of them, but yes, I'm going to paint them with a broad brush. I think of all of them, and I think, why do they divide up the generations? All right, that's right. That's not how God established it. That's right. God yeah. wants the older to learn from the younger, yes. and, the, yes. uh, uh, and the younger to learn from the older. It goes both ways. I look at the children, and I see them out there having fun learning of God. Come on. And I want to look at the generation older than me, and I want to see God steadfast in their lives. God wants us to be united. Amen. Okay? Amen. We think about the problems that come in our world. And it's all about division. Yeah, this right. group against yes, that group. Yes, sir. Whether it's political, whether it's cultural, whether it's anything economic, it's always a group against another group. Mm -hmm. Why add generational come division on. to that? Yes, yeah, sir. That's right. This whole message about learning of Jesus, it's the absolute truth. We need to learn of Jesus from his word. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit through his word. But so much of that is seen in the faithfulness of God, in the people of God. Look to those who've been serving God. And even if, even if it's an older person who, who's come to faith recently, my goodness, how much can they tell you just because they've been living longer than you? Living longer than you. Say, boy, I wish I hadn't made those mistakes, and if I'd been serving God longer, I wouldn't have. But he's been so good to me, so merciful, because oh, yes. he's forgiven me. Yes. And now I have hope of eternity. Amen. I might not have hope of decades, <clears throat> but I've got hope of, of eternal life. All right. All right. And even if it's a young person who's just out in, the, in, in the, the, the backyard having fun, that joy of the Lord is the strength that can bring them all the way through however many decades they've got in the future. Keep serving God. Keep serving God. Keep learning. Keep getting into the Bible and seeing what he has to say. And for any of us that are somewhere in the middle, God is good. Can't you see it all around us? All around us. What a good God we serve. Amen. Amen. If you come to the people, what a good God we serve. That we can see the world falling apart, but God keeping us together. Yes. Amen. 
That we can know, okay, I'm praying, I'm asking God for something, but I'm going to be faithful while I'm waiting. Because that's what he's shown me in his word. And I've seen it in the lives of those who've gone before me, and I'm going to teach it to those who come up behind. May all who come behind us find us faithful, the song says it is. May the light of our devotion, may the fire of our devotion light the way. God, help me to learn of you, and help me to teach others of you. As we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning in reverence to God, Jesus said to learn of him. As we pray this morning, let it be our prayer. God, help me to be faithful and to learn of you, but not to let that obligation of showing your love to another pass me by. God, help me to be an example. Help me to be an example in word and in deed, holy in all manner of conversation. God, not to spout off my own uh, misunderstandings, but to just speak of the good things that you have done for me. Because I know if you've done it in my life, you can do it for anybody else. God bless you as you pray.
Help us to learn of you, yes. to learn of your Son by your Spirit, to continue in salvation and righteousness, to teach another by the truth of your word, that they may see even in our lives the truth, the truth of your righteousness and of your blessings. Yes. Keep your hand upon us today through the week until we meet back again in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.